Hi there and welcome to this video in the IBM Cloud Foundation Skill Series. And in this video, I'm going to introduce and talk about enterprise accounts in IBM Cloud. Now, enterprise accounts are all about managing multiple IBM Cloud accounts, uh, and in particular, they're billing from a single place. So this topic tends to only really apply to users that manage more than um, two or three accounts. And in my experience, larger companies tend to be more interested in this feature because they tend to either have or need multiple accounts uh, and also a subscription account, which we'll, you will also need for this. But even so, uh, this can be a good topic to get some knowledge on. So this is going to be a bit of a lecture type video to introduce and uh, give you the knowledge. And in the next video, I'll actually show you how to create an enterprise account. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to start off by just going over the basics of what an IBM Cloud account looks like from a logical um, point of view, since this gives you uh, the background or sets the groundwork to the problem that an enterprise account um, sets out to solve. So an account will always start with an, uh, with an account owner. Now, this is basically the owner that is kind of the super user. So every account has an account owner and the account owner can do anything they like in the account. So like any other user, the account owner is identified by an IBM ID, which is effectively an active email address. Next, you have invited users. Now, these are typically developers uh, or other people that you want to have in your account that create or access services to build or manage applications within your account. So the first users obviously have to be invited by the account owner. And the account owner then grants those users privileges uh, within the account to do things such as create, manage or view resources and services. And the account owner can also delegate a number of administrative rights to users as well, uh, including things like billing rights. But remember, users are invited to the account and IBM Cloud helps you implement a security system of least privilege by giving nobody any rights to anything unless you as the account owner explicitly grant them. So next up we have our services catalog. So right now there are over 190 services in the catalog that you can choose to provision in your account. So within a few clicks and taps of your keyboard uh, you can have some pretty complex services up and ready to go within your account within a few minutes. Now in very general terms uh, you can divide those services into three different groups. Classic infrastructure, IAM managed services and Cloud Foundry services. And the reason I've grouped them like this is that they um, they, they have different permission systems behind them uh, for the time being at least. So on the left there we have classic infrastructure. So this largely covers the infrastructure as a service offering um, that IBM Cloud has with the noted exception of virtual private cloud. So classic includes bare metal servers. Um, so those are dedicated private servers that you can control from the chassis up. And it also includes virtual servers and shared and dedicated network devices, as well as storage services that support all of that too. Then on the right, we have Cloud Foundry services, and these are platform as a service offering. So with Cloud Foundry, you basically provision a runtime instance, uh, develop or upload your code to the instance, and the application is then up and running uh, without the need to even think about server hardware and so on. And of course, you can integrate it with other services in IBM Cloud as well. So if you were to use Cloud Foundry services, then you'd be involved in creating and managing organizations and spaces and giving your invited users access rights to those. So the group in the middle, uh, which is now far the largest, is what we collectively call IAM managed services or identity and access managed managed services. So this includes things like virtual private cloud, which is IBM software defined uh, infrastructure as a service, it includes um, uh, and, and virtual servers. Uh, it includes Kubernetes, includes OpenShift, includes databases as a service, object storage, blockchain, serverless compute, as well as VMware, among a whole load of other offerings as well. Now these services are essentially managed using resource groups, which are logical containers for service instances or resources and you can grant them very granular access to users to either service instances service types or whole resource groups and you can do that individually user by user or better still you can come up with uh, user roles define uh, 
access by role type as an access group and then add users to those access groups. So those are three sorts of types of services basically broken down by how access to them is managed. Then of course you have other account level services. So you have certain account level auditing, alerts and notification services that you can configure as well as screens which allow you to easily do your account and user management. You also have a section in the account for billing and usage so you can keep track of your spend. So again, the account owner is the only person who can see this by default, but they can grant access to say, billing managers so they can see this information as well. Now, of course, the account is secure. IBM provides services within the, within the cloud that protect your account and resources, but note that security is a shared responsibility as well. So at the end of the day, you know, you must be sure that your applications and data are secure and uh, IBM obviously provides services and guidance on how to do that as well. But um, IBM also offer the ability to have multi-factor authentication when logging into the account, um, as well as things like restrictions on what IP sources can log in, time of day, all that sort of thing as well. So the last thing on this slide is single sign-on. So if you wish, you can federate your account with your identity provider. Uh, so in a lot of cases, that's something like Active Directory. So that means that you can set up a trust between IBM Cloud and your Active Directory Federated Services Installation, or ADFS. Uh, and when a user logs into IBM Cloud, it exchanges SAML tokens with Active Directory. Active Directory sends um, assertions about the user back to IBM Cloud. And assuming the token provides the correct assertions, the user is logged in. So here the user is basically logging in via their organization's login process, which again can enhance security on the account. So I've mentioned Active Directory and ADFS, but it actually works with any um, identity management system that can handle and generate SAML tokens. So basically every account within IBM Cloud looks like this at a very high level. While it's possible to use the features of IAM to effectively keep projects apart, so basically you can use resource groups to ring fence the resources of a project environment and IAM to grant tight access to those resources. For a lot of large organizations with multiple sub companies or cost centers and so on, it can actually be far more useful to have multiple accounts. So each account is then effectively standalone and autonomous and can be owned and managed by users much closer and perhaps responsive to the business need. And in many ways, it reduces a lot of complexity and potential issues around um, soft account limits on resources and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I've actually seen lots of large organizations use multiple accounts for these very reasons. Now, the main problem with that tends to be around billing. So if you um, use one account with lots of resource groups, then yes, you can filter your bill by resource group, but it gets complicated quickly, especially if you use non IAM managed services. So for example, um, I'm working with one large company at the moment that uses classic infrastructure, and they're finding it really hard to separate different projects and their usage in a single account, because the older permissions model that underpins classic doesn't support separation very well, and multiple accounts is actually a benefit to them. So in terms of billing, if you use multiple accounts, then you end up with multiple bills, so one per account. So again, managing lots of invoices or subscriptions can become unwieldy uh, very quickly, especially if you're the person in the finance department that then actually has to keep track of it all. So to alleviate all this, um, IBM introduced the concept of an enterprise account. Uh, and for the next uh, few minutes, we're going to uh, take a look at those and how they actually work. Now, the main purpose of the enterprise account is to essentially take away the complexity of managing billing and resources across lots of different accounts. So while the different accounts in the enterprise are to all intents and purposes still autonomous in so much as to gain access, you need to be invited to the actual account and a user in one account can't access resources in another without privileges to do so. The headache of managing billing and reviewing usage is taking away because the billing manager at the top level enterprise account only ever gets one invoice for the whole enterprise and they can use built-in reporting to show them which account has used what or which group has used what and cross-bill accordingly. 
I guess the other thing to mention is that enterprises are also based on a subscription model. So bringing all that usage together under a subscription also means that the organisation as a whole is benefiting from discounted pricing. Now this diagram shows the building blocks of an enterprise. So at the top, you have the enterprise account itself. The enterprise doesn't typically own any resources, so developers won't be in there building systems, for example. The enterprise account is basically there to manage what sits underneath uh, in the structure. So in its simplest form, you can then add an account or accounts directly under the enterprise, and this would be where developers are then given access. However, you can also layer the structure by introducing account groups. So think of an account group as a way of grouping similar accounts together uh, into the topology. So then from a, a billing perspective, you can easily see charges coming from the group um, as well as drilling into the individual accounts. So as you can see on this diagram, you can nest account groups too. And while this diagram shows four levels in the enterprise, if you wanted to, you can go as deep as five levels um, through the use of groups. So again, it's worth thinking about the structure before you start laying things out. But having said that, you can create groups and move accounts between groups as and when you actually need to. So let's have a quick think about user access to all this and how that actually works as well. Well, it's pretty much the same as user access to ordinary accounts where users will only have access to the bits of the enterprise that they actually need. So for example, using the structure on the screen at the moment, if you have a developer and they work in France, you would invite that user to the France account and give them the privileges in the France account that they need to do their job. They would have no access to anything else other than in that account. Similarly, if I set up a user in the enterprise account at the top, they wouldn't have access to any of the child accounts by default. The only way to give them access is to explicitly provide them with access in the appropriate account. In terms of access to billing information, the only way to see that is to be granted access in the enterprise account. So even if you're the account owner of a child account, you will not be able to see the billing information of that account because it's all dealt with by the enterprise level. So again, each child account in the enterprise is autonomous and remains entirely separate from all the other accounts in the enterprise. Of course, all privileges that you grant in the enterprise are also granular. So if you wanted to, you could grant access to users at the enterprise level that enable them to manage child accounts. So that's uh, user access, billing and more. But um, it's not automatically granted and you have fine control over what is granted. So enterprise users have no access to any resources in the child accounts. They have to be invited to those accounts as well. So let's have a, a, a bit of a closer look at the billing aspect of, of an enterprise. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the enterprise account itself owns the billing for the whole of the enterprise. So that means that the enterprise account owner receives the invoice for the whole enterprise and that same account pays for the usage of all the accounts in the enterprise via subscription credit. So this means that an enterprise account must be a subscription account which obviously means a committed spend, but that comes with the advantage of discounted pricing. Uh, and that subscription amount is described as a subscription pool. So it's like a pool of funding for all of the accounts in the enterprise. Now, when an account joins the enterprise, if it's a pre-existing account with a subscription, that subscription ownership transfers to the enterprise account where it's added to the subscription pool. Um, if it's a paygo account, then it effectively stops being a paygo account and uses credits from the subscription pool from there on in. Now each month at the end of the billing cycle, IBM will issue an invoice and that invoice will be paid from the subscription credits. And of course, if there's not enough credit in the pool, then there will be a request for additional payment, which again will be handled at the enterprise level. So from there, the billing administrator in the enterprise will be able to see the breakdown of the billing in several views. Uh, and that then makes it easy to cross bill departments within the organization. So again, using IAM privileges, you can set up different users who can then see different views. So for example, the financial officer can see everything uh, and from that have the ability to track and recover costs from each department. Department leads can be set up so they can see everything in their department 
uh, which can be denoted by an account group. And then team leads can, uh, can be set up with access to see what their team is spending. So it's all very flexible, highly granular, as well as being um, actually quite simple to manage as well. Now the process of creating an enterprise is equally simple. You basically need to start off with an account that is a subscription account. And from there, you then create your enterprise account. So to create an enterprise account, you just need the correct user, right? So typically the account owner or admin role on the billing account management service, and you can then access the enterprise screen from the console and set it up. From there, you can either create new accounts or you can import existing accounts into the enterprise. So again, uh, you need the right privileges on the account that you're importing to do that, but basically the accounts that you have the rights to import will show in the enterprise management screen and you just click and follow the screen prompts to add them. So one note of caution, once you've added an account to an enterprise, you cannot remove the account from the enterprise. So it's a one way action. So double check you have the right account and you're sure that you want to add the account to your enterprise before absolutely committing. The other thing to note is that an account can only ever belong to one enterprise. So if for some reason you were to have multiple enterprises, and uh, I can't think of an obvious reason for wanting to do that, uh, but if you did, just check that you're adding an account to the right enterprise. Of course, you can also create new accounts in your enterprise from the enterprise screen. By default, the user creating the account will be the new account owner, but you can also specify other users by entering their IBM ID or email address in the account owner field as you create it. Similarly, you can add new groups as and when you need to and move accounts between groups. Um, of course, the rule stand, that stands here is that enterprises cannot be more than five layers deep. So again, you know, this is all pretty simple stuff. Now, if you do import an existing account in, into an enterprise or move an account between account groups, you might be concerned that your carefully crafted account permissions are changed in some way. Uh, but fear not, everything is preserved and remains unchanged with, of course, the exception that the billing for the account moves up to the enterprise and its subscription pool and that the billing info for the account is only available to view from the enterprise. OK, so that's a quick overview of what an IBM Cloud Enterprise is when you might want to use them and uh, some additional considerations as well. So in the next video, I'll actually show you how to create an enterprise via the console. But in the meantime, I hope this video has been useful. If it has, please consider subscribing to my channel and get notified uh, when new content drops. But for now, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.